we have Francisco Megoya, head chef of Modernist Cuisine, prolific author. <laughs> um, he's going to tell you all about the history and culture of pizza in the Americas. Please welcome Francisco Megoya. Thanks. All right, so there's a lot to cover in the next hour, uh, so I'm just going to get going here. Uh, talking about the history and the culture of pizza in the Americas uh, is, in order to talk about that, we need to talk about pizza in general, where it came from, uh, and how it got to here. Uh, pizza is, I dare say, uh, probably the most popular food in the world. You'll find pizza everywhere. In fact, we we wanted to find out where can you not find pizza? In what parts of the world can you not find pizza? There's two islands in the Pacific, Tuvalu and Kuribati, are the two places on earth where you cannot find pizza, but you can find pizza everywhere else. Which is interesting because you can't find tacos everywhere, you can't find uh, barbecue everywhere, but a food such as pizza has made a home pretty much everywhere on the planet. So just to give you a little introduction to uh, uh, where I work, this clicker's not clicking. Is it working now? It's not clicking. Okay. All right. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. All right. So this is uh, the team. The man in the middle, his name is Nathan Merville. He's my boss. He's basically the founder of Marnus Cuisine. Uh, he's basically a brainchild and, and, you know, he basically funds all the research. Uh, it's not like he's in the kitchen all day with us. He's basically a, uh, you know, he, he provides ideas, inspiration, funds, of course, and uh, the means to create these books. But my team is composed of R&D chefs. Uh, it's four R&D chefs, a food scientist, and her assistant. Uh, so basically, a lot of what we do is based on science. It's based on experimentation. It's based, based on doing a lot of research to uh, get to the massive volumes that we we are uh, sort of known for. So if I can have the next slide, please. That's uh, my kitchen. Obviously, it's not mine. I wish it was. Uh, it is uh, truly a, a wonderful place to work in. Uh, we have a, basically three environments combined here. Uh, one is, it's the most obvious, it is that it's a commercial kitchen. Uh, thank you with you know, all the machines that go along with that, the big ovens, the big mixers, and so forth. Uh, but we also have a lot of scientific equipment that we use to measure experiment results. Uh, that is, for example, if we're trying to find out what the best flour is to make Neapolitan pizza, we have a texture analyzer and an, another machine that's called an extensograph that basically stretches dough, tells you how strong it is, what tenacity it has. So when we say this flour is the best flour for Neapolitan pizza, it's not necessarily because of, you know, we just think it tastes good. It's because it performs really well and it's going to save you a lot of headaches. Uh, but the third environment that we also have here that is perhaps less obvious is that we have a lot of home equipment. We write our books also with home bakers, home uh, food enthusiasts in mind. It's harder to do that because there's a lot more hand-holding that uh, requires for that, but also because a lot of home equipment is not very good, especially ovens. I think every home oven, I don't think that there's such a thing as a good home oven, uh, even the ones that are like thousands of dollars, but there's ways to hack that to make pretty good pizza. So that's our kitchen. Uh, next to my kitchen, we have this uh, wonderful place that I visit every now and then, which is, it's literally, I can see this from my kitchen. It's a machine shop. We're part of a bigger uh, company that does a lot of research and a lot of, uh, you know, developing of inventions and ideas. And so this machine shop, basically, if you've seen in our books, when, let's say, for example, a KitchenAid mixer is cut in half or an oven is cut in half, these are the guys that do it. Uh, it's a very interesting process because it turns out when I first started working there, I thought they would put the, I don't know, the oven through like a water jet and just cut it in half. Uh, but the true reality is that they take the whole thing apart, cut every piece in half, and then they put it back together. It's, the precision work is incredible. So 
let's see, these are the books we've published. Uh, the most recent one is on the way on the far right. Uh, the very first one is on the far left. It was a book published in 2011 on the science of gastronomy. Uh, and we're currently working on a book on pastry, which is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. But don't hold your breath, it's probably gonna be at least three, four more years at least before it comes out. Uh, this is some of the stats from this book that we published. Our book on pizza, Marnus Pizza, was published in 2021. And we did a bunch of traveling. We went to have pizza around the world. Uh, it is, you know, it sounds like, a, initially it sounds like a dream job, right? We flew around the world to eat pizza. But let me tell you this, there is such a thing as too much pizza. There is a point where you can't even smell it anymore because just the thought of it might make you sick because you have to taste it, it becomes work at this point. So we traveled 100,000 miles, the book is 1,708 pages, it's 35 pounds, about 3,700 photographs, 200,000 hours worked amongst the team, the total team is 25 people. Uh, we visited 250 pizzerias, there's 1,016 recipes in our book, not just dough, but also toppings, sauces, and so forth. Uh, 800 pizzas eaten on the road, probably more at the lab. Uh, 450,000 words, and it's three total volumes with a kitchen manual. Uh, these are the three volumes on the left, history and fundamentals, uh, techniques and ingredients, recipes, and the far right is the kitchen manual, which is basically a portable version of the recipes, which you can bring into the kitchen. Uh, it's stain resistant and so forth. It's just handy when you have olive oil and tomato sauce flying around. So uh, that's the book. So we also based a lot of our findings on a database, which is basically a Excel spreadsheet where we manually input 900 uh, recipes. Uh, we used that information to perform over 500 experiments. Uh, we consulted over 400 cookbooks in many languages. With pizza, it's interesting. It turns out that there aren't a ton of pizza books. And 99.9% .9 of pizza books are for home cooks, home bakers. There are very few that are for actually professional pizzaiolos. Uh, we compiled over 1,800 recipes. We baked around 12,000 pizzas in our lab. Unfortunately, I tasted most of them, and when this project was done, I needed to lose some weight. So uh, it, was, it was not pretty, let me tell you. Um, over 100,000 data points analyzed. So anyway, we use a lot of this information in order to start to understand what people understand what pizza is and how it's done and how it's made and what it should look like, etc. People feel very strongly about pizza. <laughs> I'm sure in this room that is also the case. When you are talking about pizza, it's almost like people talk about their sports teams and that's their team and they don't wanna hear anything else about any other kind of pizza. So uh, what we had to do was we had to be open to every kind of pizza and we had to research it and we had to taste it and we had to really take a close look. So we, ha we start with the history. The history of pizza is a little bit obscure, mostly because pizza at its origins was the food of poor people. And because it was the food of poor people, uh, there isn't a lot of documentation around it. It's not like it was written about in archives or academic papers or in uh, newspapers of the time. It was just what poor people ate, and a lot of people who were uh, basically uh, historians and writers and so forth didn't have a lot of interest in what uh, the majority of the population was doing. So we had to really dig uh, to find information on where pizza came from. So where does a word come from? Uh, this is a, a definitive, uh, there's a non-answer here, mostly because we can't trace exactly where the word pizza comes from. In Europe and in uh, the Middle East, there are words that sound like pizza. There are words that you could really extrapolate. Well, it could have come from any one of these words here, from pita, pite, pide, all of those words sort of sound like pizza. And in fact, some of these foods kind of look like pizza. It's a flatbread, right? But when did a flatbread become a pizza? When, when did that moment of inception happen where it's like, okay, now it's pizza? So this was a big, uh, I guess, hole in our research, which is that the word pizza, as we know it today, what it describes today, we don't know where it came from. When we find the word pizza in manuscripts from like the 1600s, for example, these were books where the word pizza was used to describe something sweet. It was more of a tart. It was something that used almond meal and it had uh, dried fruit. So nothing to do with pizza as we know it today. Uh, we are very curious still as to where that transition happened from it meaning one thing to meaning what it means today. 
So this is, uh, to me, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, you know, set of statistics, mostly because uh, while I was doing this research as to you know, where, why, how did pizza go to the world? How did it go out? Uh, and I never thought I'd say this, but the reality is that the reason why pizza is enjoyed throughout the world is thanks to cholera. So when would you have thought to thank a, uh, uh, a pandemic for something, right? Uh, Naples was a, in the 18, mid-1800s, it, was, it had a, a cholera epidemic. Uh, it had a cholera epidemic because the water, the drinking water had combined with sewage water. And so people were dying, uh, understandably, like hundreds of thousands of Neapolitans died during this period of time. In 1871, Italy was finally unified. So Italy hasn't always been Italy. Italy was regions, and in 1871, it was finally uh, unified as one country. So when it was unified, King Umberto I visited uh, Naples with his wife, Margarita. And uh, one of the things that they, they did on their visit was uh, basically inaugurate what was called the risanimento, or the rehabilitation of Naples. And what that meant was that all of these poor people had to go. Uh, they had to go because they had to basically build a new sewage system uh, to resolve the problem of cholera. But if you think that they gave them temporary housing, that did not happen. It's, you have to go, thank you, go to another country, but you can't stay here. Uh, so that explains uh, what this mass migration uh, was, specifically for Naples. But it also happened, if you see this period of time between 1876 and 1915, you have close to three million Italians emigrating to different parts of the globe. The preferred number one destination was New York, uh, followed by Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo. Okay? Uh, but it's because of this, it's because so many Italians left the country, and these were three places that I mentioned, New York, uh, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, but they also went everywhere that they could find a place uh, to live. So, thanks to cholera, you have pizza. Uh, what we know as authentic Neapolitan pizza, authentic is a term that I, uh, I don't use very often because I think everybody here would have a different definition of what authentic means. It's like, what is traditional, what's authentic? Uh, but when we look at Neapolitan pizza and we think, and we see it, we go, this looks authentic. Uh, but the truth is that pizza as we know it today, Neapolitan specifically, could not have existed until the 1950s and 1990s. Why? Because you need a specific type of flour, you need a specific type of machinery, you need a specific type of, of process to come up with pizzas that look like this. Before the 1950s, Neapolitan pizza was more what you see in that picture there, which was a pretty sad looking, thin uh, pizza that has nothing to do with the pizza that we know today that has a tall rim, that has like that nice leoparding. Uh, it was a very different animal. All the pizzas that you see on the left were taken during our visits uh, to Italy, uh, which we visited a few times during that, the, our research. These are all the modern versions of what Neapolitan pizza is today. So uh, what was the situation in Italy? Uh, so Benito Mussolini, he came to power in 1922, and his biggest push was, uh, you know, they didn't, a country that consumed so much wheat wasn't producing its own wheat. Uh, it was importing a lot of wheat from different parts of Europe. Uh, and so his big push was to create uh, enough of an environment where farmers in Italy would want to grow the wheat and have enough capacity to satisfy the population that consumed so much wheat, whether it be pasta, whether it be pizza, whether it be bread, uh, there wasn't enough wheat. So this, this was a big movement to get uh, Italy to become self-sufficient. Uh, you can see this is a coin uh, that's Benito Mussolini and behind the coin uh, you have a stock of wheat. Uh, to this day, Italy is still not self-sufficient when it comes to flour. I mean, Italy is not a huge country, uh, but it, it does require copious amounts of flour, so it imports it from Russia, it imports it from France. A lot of it comes from the United States. A lot of it also comes from Canada, uh, which is where they get the stronger wheats. When you buy, let's say, uh, you own a pizzeria and you buy caputo flour, a lot of the caputo flour that you're getting is from, uh, from Canada or the United States, and they mix it in with different parts of, of wheat from different parts of Europe. Uh, so yes, still not an autonomy of, of wheat in Italy, but better than it was uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. 
Early pizza in the United States. Uh, so we had to do a lot of research in uh, basically with uh, microfilm, uh, with old newspaper clippings, with uh, you know trying to find books that would talk about pizza. And these were some of the very interesting ones we found. And I found it very interesting, this is not intentional, that the first mention of pizza in the United States was from the San Diego Union uh, newspaper uh, in 1882. And I mean, that's kind of a big deal because 1882, there was a radio publication in San Diego talking about pizza. Uh, very interesting. And then we can see some uh, publications. For example, uh, one of my favorite ones is 1894. It's the first mention of a, a business, a pizzeria forno in New York City. Uh, this is an important number because there's a, uh, one of those urban myths that uh, 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 the first pizzeria in, in New York City was in 1905 uh, with, um, uh, God, the name is, is, is eluding me right now, but Lombardi's. Uh, but it was not, absolutely not. I mean, you have to imagine that with a, such a huge Italian uh, population, 1905, 1905 uh, 1904 was already a few years after many thousands of Italian immigrants had, immigrants had moved to uh, the United States. So these are just some of the, the clippings we found. Uh, I want to call your attention, there's two pictures there in the middle row. The third one from the left uh, is Filippo Milone. I'm gonna come back to him in another slide. But I think he was one of the more instrumental people in uh, getting pizza off the ground in the United States. He was an impresario, he owed different pizzerias. Uh, unknown, I mean, when he closed his businesses, he sort of like disappeared off the face of the earth. But he was probably one of the most important figures in uh, pizza in the United States. Uh, the ovens, right? I mean, these are things that are specific to the United States. I mean, these are ovens that you still see in pizzerias. Frank Mastro was what we call an unsung pizza hero because he invented these ovens. You still see these today, especially in New York style pizzerias. It's more or less the same mechanism. They more or less look the same. Uh, these are ovens that have sort of stood the, the test of time. So some important, some really cool like uh, uh, publicity that we found uh, for, for these particular ovens. This, this wasn't too hard to find, but um, an interesting uh, person that is, is part of the landscape of the history of pizza in the United States, uh, Frank Mastro. So I don't know if this has happened to you. It certainly has happened to me with many things, uh, which is this idea that we have of these foods that we had as children, <clears throat> that this was the best pizza, or fill in the blank with whatever other food. Uh, this happens very much, it's this sort of food that we idealize and we, 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 you know, we go back home when we're older and we want to take our kids to this pizzeria and your palate has developed, you're, you're, you're more uh, discriminating, you've had better food and you go back, it's the same pizza, but it's you who has changed. Uh, and that's sadly the story of most of the pizza from our childhood. You might be thinking, no, but that's not my story. It is absolutely 100% your story. <laughs> um, pizza travels. So these are the different places that we visited. Uh, this is, you know, the, the idea of where to go was wherever there was a style of, of pizza specific to the place, or alternatively, a place where uh, pizza was culturally and gastronomically important. For example, if we think about uh, Portland, Oregon, there's this in Portland, Portland South pizza, but the pizza scene in Portland is, is massive. It's very important. It's one of the best in the world. So we went to a place like that as well. So what, how did we decide where to go? Well, we visited more than 200 pizzerias and you, know, you only have enough time. We can't you know, spend 10 years writing this book. Uh, so we visited a fraction of all the pizzerias that exist on the planet, but it was basically a snapshot of what pizza is out there and where pizza is beloved and how people make it. So we selected it uh, basically on whether they were highly rated uh, or if they were in like guides. For example, Italy has a really great uh, pizza guide. It's called Gambero Rosso. They do it for restaurants as well, but for pizzerias as well. So we picked, uh, do you know how the Michelin Guide has three stars, two stars, one stars? Uh, the Gambero Rosso has like three slices, two slices, or one slice. Uh, so we went to all the three slice ones because, I mean, while it might seem like, you know, you know, can think whatever we want about Michelin, but a three Michelin star is gonna be, have a certain sort of appreciation. So we thought in this case, 
a three slice pizzeria is is a place that we definitely had to go to. So we went to all of those in the entire country of Italy. Um, why did we go to these pizzerias? For the most part, we went there obviously to taste the pizza, but also to talk to the pizzaiolos. We wanted to talk to the owners, the people that were making the pizza. Uh, in many instances, it was so that I could work with them, so that I could make pizza with them. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of people were very open about their process and their recipes and how they make it, uh, which was priceless because uh, initially I thought going into it that people would have like super secretive methods that they didn't want to uh, share with anybody. And what was even more interesting about that is that the pizzerias that were not very good were the ones that did not want to share their secrets. I'm like, you can keep your secrets. We don't, we don't necessarily need them for this. And the ones that were like highly regarded, Franco Pepe, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, here's the recipe, and I'm going to show you how to make it, and we're going to make pizza together. So a very generous group of people, definitely. Naples, undoubtedly, this is where pizza comes from, and Neapolitan pizza is the mother of all pizzas. Um, it is where, you know, it, it is interesting because if you've had a real Neapolitan pizza, meaning the pizza that is baked for 60, 90 seconds, it comes out blistered on the outside, it's kind of wet inside, and you lift it and it doesn't hold a, a, a tip, that, there's no other pizza like that. Uh, and it's, it's a pizza that is it's very unique in, in its style. Um, and so this is where, where we can really trace the origin of, of pizza to, and some of the takeaways are these. Uh, in Naples, we have what's called the AVPN, the Associazione Verace Pizza Napolitana, which basically designates whether you're making real Neapolitan-style pizza or not. And <laughs> this was really funny because all of the, they basically give you a sticker or like a, a designation that says, okay, you're making authentic Neapolitan pizza. Every pizza that we spoke to that had that sticker on their door did not make pizza uh, in the exact way that the AP, AVPN had told them to do it. So like it, it has these very stringent rules and and how to make the pizzas, and they all diverted from it. Every single one of them made it differently. Uh, so it makes you wonder, you know, how, uh, what is the, the, I guess, the purpose of, of, of unifying, like, that sort of knowledge. Um, let's see, what else? There's Centennial Pizzerias. There's actually five pizzerias in Naples that are over 100 years old, uh, incredibly still in the same family for the most part, uh, for each, each one of these pizzerias, where the great, great, great grandson is, like, making pizza. So talk about roots, talk about history. That's definitely where you're going to find it. So these are more modern versions of Neapolitan pizza. These were all found in Naples uh, or surrounding areas. There's a, on the bottom right, uh, that's a pizza. I mentioned Franco Pepe earlier. He's, a, uh, he's in a place called Caserta. Uh, he makes these like really, like in the bottom right, he calls that his margarita spagliata. Spagliata means incorrect margarita. And basically it's inverted, right? The sauce is on top, the cheese is at the bottom. So there's a lot of people that are thinking in very, I don't want to say modernist ways, but they are very much against the norm of what traditional Neapolitan pizza is, which is interesting to see. They would never say that they're being innovative, but we call it like we see it. These are definitely more, uh, I would say, experimental, uh, non-traditional pizzas. And, you know, there's a line outside the door. You have to wait two hours to get into Franco Pepe. You have to, we have to talk about Rome too, mostly because you know it is in Italy, uh, but it's it is not a city that has a recent his history of pizza. Uh, in fact, I I'm probably uh, I don't know I'm going to guess that everybody here is an, has an idea of what Roman pizza is. It's an, an image that pops into your mind, and I'm going to explain to you why you may be right, but you also may be wrong. So. One of the key takeaways is that we were surprised that it's more of a slice takeaway sort of culture with pizza. Uh, at the center of this is a pizza, his name is Gabriele Bonci. Gabriele Bonci is like my age. Um, so he started making pizza probably like 20 years ago. And, and when most people talk about Roman pizza, they think about his pizza, which is the Altaglio pizza that you order by the slice. You tell them how big you want it. It is truly an amazing pizza. But there's also all of these other pizzas that are also called Roman pizza. So what is Roman pizza? There's pizza tonda, there's pizza, uh, 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 sorry, Altaglio, there's pizza romana, there's all these things are called Roman pizza. So it was a bit of, of a uh, complicated thing to try to decipher what were we gonna call Roman pizza. And so we have all these recipes in our book, obviously, but we call them different names uh, depending on the format that they come in. But there are many kinds of Roman pizza. 
Sao Paulo. Okay, so why did I jump from Rome to Sao Paulo? Because Sao Paulo is a city of, I think, 20 million inhabitants, but in Sao Paulo alone, there are 2,000 pizzerias. That's a lot of pizzerias. Yes, it's 20 million people, but 2,000 pizzerias is a big deal. Uh, it's a very unique style of pizza. It's very different from Neapolitan. It's like cracker thin crust and they put very interesting things on them. I mean, this is one of those interesting things about pizza that adapts to where it's eaten. Uh, in this case, we have hearts of palm, you have hard boiled eggs, tuna, shrimp. Uh, there's an interesting sauce uh, that's called golf sauce, which is basically, I think here we call it fancy sauce, which is you mix mustard and, I mean, mayo and ketchup, right? Uh, that goes on pizza, and uh, it, it is, strictly a dinner item. When we were doing our research in Sao Paulo, uh, we went to, we would go, like schedule visits to pizzerias, and if we sit at lunchtime, they'd be like, well, we're not open. Nobody's open for lunch for pizza uh, in Sao Paulo. So it, it is a dinner occasion. It's a white tablecloth occasion. It is a pizza that is delivered to you and set on the side of your table, and a, and a waiter, server comes and gives you a slice. And when you're done with that slice, they come by and they give you another slice and you do not eat it with your hands. It's a fork and knife sort of situation. I know a lot of people here are gonna think that that is sacrilege, but that is just how it's eaten in Sao Paulo. Uh, let's see here, this was a, a, a pizzeria we went to which is trying to like change all that. It is open for lunch. There's a sign here, uh, you can see it in, in the bottom, it says use your hands to eat pizza. Uh, so they're trying to change all that. They're trying to sort of change the culture of how people eat pizza and how the people see pizza in Sao Paulo, uh, which I found interesting. And they were pretty full. It was lunchtime and, you know, there were people eating pizza. So this was the first uh, pizzeria still exists. And it's one of those places that you go into and it has this like patina of like just being over 100 years old, like nothing has changed in there, uh, including the kitchen. And it just, it was, it's like this time capsule, a very interesting place. Was it my favorite pizza? I, I think that's almost like irrelevant at this point. So this was more like a historical visit to, to taste the first pizza or the first pizzeria in Sao Paulo. So here you can see, you know, what it looks like. Uh, you know, there's, it's definitely, it, you know, sometimes it's baked in a pan. It is thin crust, it is crispy. Um, and you know, with unusual, uh, unusual to us toppings, um, I just for me it was unusual to put a hard-boiled egg on a pizza. It's already cooked, and you put it back in, it's like going to be a little rubbery uh, when it comes out. But to each his own. Buenos Aires is another huge pizza city. Uh, Buenos Aires has a the entire opposite style of pizza from uh, Sao Paulo. It is basically it's more cheese than pizza. I'm going to show you a picture. Yeah, you can see in the top right, it is a uh, type of pizza that when you cut into it, there's so much cheese that it just wraps the slice. It is something that you eat with your hands, you eat it standing, uh, and it's a quick, you know, have one slice and you're good to go. Uh, so definitely a diff mo very different, you know, these countries are side by side. Uh, what we were told is that pizza in Buenos Aires ha is like this. It's like huge, it's thick crust, it has sauce, it has all this cheese because most of the immigrants that came to Italy came from very poor backgrounds, right? So you come to this land of plenty, so all of a sudden it's like, let's make it bigger, let's put more sauce and, you know, more cheese the merrier. The, the, the abundance of cheese was almost like a sign of, like, well-being and wealth, right? Uh, another thing that we found here that was interesting is that the people that were making pizza in the bottom right corner, this man, uh, Leopoldo, he had been making pizza in that pizzeria for 40 years. I mean, that's... To me, it's remarkable to have that sort of like discipline, but I mean, what could you do for 40 years and still be, you know, loving doing it, uh, you know, same job day in and day out. So this was not just the case here, this was the case in at least 10 different pizzerias that we visited. Tokyo, uh, you know, a lot of people were asking us, you guys should go to Tokyo. Uh, and we thought, well, why? There isn't like a Tokyo style pizza. Uh, it seems like going to Tokyo is a commitment. I mean, even though we're in Seattle and it's relatively, you know, a nine-hour flight, it's still a nine-hour flight to go uh, just to have pizza. So it was interesting. Uh, we had uh, a, uh, we visited a few different pizzerias. It's more or less the same style. I, I think we would call it more like a, a derivative of Neapolitan style. Uh, one of the things that we noticed was that 
uh, the amount of olive oil that goes into the pizza topping uh, is enough that when you launch it into the oven, it ignites. Uh, it's, it's like equal parts of tomato sauce or crushed tomatoes and olive oil. Uh, the oven is also salted before the pizza goes in. So very unique interpretations. And there's a, uh, I guess the original pizzeria in Tokyo is called Savoy. So if you ever go to Tokyo, that's probably where I would go to get pizza. Uh, but interesting that all of the people that have worked at Savoy and gone to open their pizzerias, it's pretty much the same pizza. Uh, so that, that is an interesting uh, sort of like, you know, what you can trace the history of, of Tokyo pizza through this one pizzeria uh, and with this particular style of, of Neapolitan, their take on Neapolitan. So you can see in the, you know, in the middle, uh, just going to town with the oil there, uh, you know, I guess. It's, it's a, 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 a preference in, in the, the Japanese palate for pizzas to really have this abundance of oil. But this is what the, the, their version of Neapolitan pizza looked like. Are there other styles? Yes. But mostly Neapolitan is, is prevalent in, in Tokyo. New York. All right. So few people feel as strongly about their pizza as New York. I mean, it, it's almost annoying uh, how... I mean, because it is, it, it's, you're going to have people telling you that it's the water. And it's the, uh, and it's like all of these things. And, you know, there is good pizza, but it's not the best pizza in the world. I mean, and there are good pizzerias, and that sounds like blasphemy to say, like, New York doesn't have, you know. Yes, sure, there's 8 million people that live in New York City. Uh, but for that per capita of how many really good pizzerias there are, it's, it's not balanced out uh, in, in our opinion. So, uh, some of the key takeaways. We had, you know, in New, the New York Times published an article a few years ago that the best pizza in New York isn't in New York, it's in New Jersey. Uh, which, you know, as you can imagine, it, the, the uproar when the New York Times says that. So we had to go to that pizzeria. It's a pizzeria it's called Razza, R-A-Z-Z-A. And it's, you literally cross the Holland Tunnel. It's right outside the Holland, Holland Tunnel. Uh, and it is some of the best pizza I've ever had, hands down. But if I looked at it, I wouldn't say this, is, this isn't New York style. This isn't something that I would get from like a New York you know, dollar slice uh, pizzeria. It's extraordinary pizza. But again, I, I don't know if it would do it justice to call it New York style. But there are some really good sliced places that have opened since we wrote the book. Uh, there's a, a place called Scar's Pizza, which if you're ever in New York City, I, I recommend it. Um, but we had some really good Detroit-style pizza. We had some really good Roman-style pizza. But it's one of those things where New York is beheld by a style, right? I mean, that, that could be a burden. Because if you're in New York and you start making Detroit, it might not be the most popular restaurant. Uh, why aren't you making New York style? Why aren't you making slices? These are things that having uh, the, you know, a place where you're making pizza could be a burden, for sure. Uh, because it doesn't allow for experimentation. It doesn't allow for you know, diverting. You, know, you have to make bagels a certain way. You have to make pastrami a certain way. And so those things could be more shackles than, than liberating, to be uh, completely honest. We did notice uh, that last point there, which was a, the camaraderie amongst pizzaiolos in, in New York City, was remarkable. They go to each other's pizzerias, they talk about pizza, they talk about recipes, they do collaborations. It's a really tight-knit group of, especially in the more talented uh, pizzaiolos in the city. So I don't know if this number means anything to you or this street, 53 and a half Spring Street, which is uh, theoretically where the origin of pizza came from. Because uh, we were trying to understand, you know, you know Lombardi's claims that they're, they, they've made a lot of claims. One of the claims is that they invented pizza, which is not true. Uh, but the other claim is that they were the first pizzeria in New York City. I said earlier something that is sort of irrefutable. You have immigrants coming. 1850, 1860s, Italian immigrants, they're going to want to make the food that they had at home. A lot of that food was pizza. They're going to wait till 1905 to have pizza? I mean, that's just absurd to even think about. So we had to do our homework before we could actually say that, right? If you're going to say, well, it's not Lombardi's. A lot of people don't care when you present information like this. We're not trying to discredit the pizza at Lombardi's. It's pretty good pizza. Um, it's, it's good. Um, I, I would... I would go back a few times for sure, 
But this whole part about saying, well, we're the first pizzeria, you know, with all of this documentation presented and still when people don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. And that's fine. But at least you all know here that it was not the first pizzeria in, in, in New York City. So this guy, I told you about him earlier. Who is Filippo Milone? Uh, so Filippo Milone was Italian, obviously an Italian immigrant. But he was the first person on record, there is a record of who was the first person who had a pizzeria in New York City. And it was this man. And he opened a bakery, he opened a couple of pizzerias. So he was a, an entrepreneur, if you will. Uh, eventually, you know, as things happen, maybe there wasn't a son or a daughter or a family who would take over the business, but eventually like, his business sort of like fizzled out. But if you wanted to say, uh, you know, who was the first person who brought, who had like a pizzeria in New York City of, uh, and that there's a record, it's this man, Filippo Milone. So these are some of the excellent pizzas that we had in New York City and Brooklyn. Uh, definitely a, a, uh, a collection of you know, pizzas that I, I would, if I had time and I was in New York City, it's uh, places I would go back to. I sometimes don't like to mention names because then somebody goes, well, did you go to so-and-so place? Oh, did you go to this place? I mean, there's, we didn't go to every pizzeria in the world. Uh, but the ones that we went to that were worth uh, mentioning are, are in our book. New Haven uh, is a style of pizza that people feel very strongly about. It's almost uh, the same as New York style. Uh, New Haven is a, uh, it's interesting to us because to, it seems that New Haven had a huge uh, percentage of, of Sicilian immigrants. Uh, and we know this because there's a lot of words that are utilized that are Sicilian dialect uh, in specifically a pizza world. So for example, when you say a pizza, that is Sicilian dialect. And so uh, from what we see from how they made pizza or how they make pizza in New Haven, we think that this is the, what more closely resembles what pizza, pizza used to be like in Italy, in Naples, right at the beginning of when pizza became pizza. Um, which is different from when you look at Neapolitan pizza now, but there seems to be, it was, it was such a, uh, a, a tight-knit group of people uh, there's still a lot of people today in New Haven that speak Sicilian dialect, even if they're not Sicilian. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting sort of like historical point of reference how pizza is made uh, in New Haven. And so people really love it. I mean, there's, there's people who love that it's kind of burnt. I don't, I don't love it when it's burnt. It's not my favorite because burnt is burnt. I mean, if you eat a burnt steak, I mean, it's a burnt steak. It's not going to be good. So... Uh, some char is okay for me, but when it's like half of it is like black, I'm like, <laughs> that's, that, I, I, there's no way I can possibly enjoy that. But some people like it. Uh, so, so there. Uh, some of the pizzas that we had there, you know, clams are a big deal. That's, that's basically the, the style, New, New Haven clam pizza, clam pie. Uh, it looks pretty good. We tried to make sure that we photograph the ones that were not burnt, so... Uh, there you go. Chicago, uh, the place that people love to hate, deep dish pizza, right? I mean, it's, it's a, you're going to get some people that say, that's not pizza. Uh, but Chicago's not just deep dish. Chicago is, is thin crust. And in fact, a lot of people from Chicago would say, like, that's the pizza. When I say pizza, that's the pizza that I'm talking about, thin crust. So, yeah, I mean, deep dish is a bomb, right? I mean, it's, it's two pounds of dough, two pounds of cheese, two pounds of meat, and it takes a long time to cook. Um, it was invented in 1940, so relatively new. Uh, you know, for the longest time, it was only available in two pizzerias, uh, Pizzeria Uno and Due. Uh, Pizzeria Uno is still around. It's a chain. You may have seen it. You may or may not have eaten from it, but uh, still around. And uh, as you know, the final sentence there is, is an interesting point, which is what I said earlier. The suburbs are mostly about thin crust, but also more and more in the city, you're going to get uh, some high quality thin crust pizza. There isn't a person who's given authorship of having invented uh, deep dish pizza, but from our research and what we read about people who uh, were around the kitchens and in the kitchens uh, who developed these pizzas, this name came up a, a couple times. We think it would, it's likely that uh, it was May Redmond who invented deep dish, or at least had a hand in it. Uh, if you've ever had pizza at Pizzeria Uno, and these like original deep dish pizzas, 
the crust is more like a pie crust. It's more like a short crust. It doesn't have like the pull and chew of like a dough. Uh, so it, it stands to understanding that uh, the people who were developing these doughs uh, had more of a connection with pie crust than with pizza crust. So that's why you're going to see those, sometimes those crusts are more like biscuity, more like a pie crust, right? So it may or may not have been May Redmond. Definitely you don't have any information confirming otherwise, uh, but her name did pop up a couple of times and, uh, you know, hopefully eventually we can corroborate this information. Detroit. Uh, Detroit is a uh, style that has recently become popular, recently in the last, five, let's say, eight years or so, uh, from being completely unknown to being a bona fide style. There's a lot of pizzerias opening, not just in Detroit, but outside Detroit that make this style. The key, the important aspects of this pizza is the cheese. Uh, so if you've ever had Detroit style pizza, you'll notice that there's this like crispy cheese around the border. Uh, that's a particular kind of cheese called Wisconsin brick cheese. Uh, and it's what gives us this like frico around the border of the pizza. So you can sort of like replace it with cheddar uh, or, you know, like pizza cheese. But Wisconsin brick cheese is definitely the best one to give us that crust. Uh, the sauce is often applied after baking. That's so that it doesn't get like that, you know, gum layer between the cheese and the sauce. So it's applied, it's heated and it's applied after baking. Um, there's a connection with the American auto industry, and so this was a picture that a, uh, an intern found, uh, which, you know, it's not just of cars, but if you see there in this picture, we saw the famous pan that is used for making Detroit-style pizza. Don't ask me who thought that, you know, this thing where we put our, our tools, let's make pizza in it. Um, but that's, that, those are the pans that were used, that mechanics used to use to put all their tools and all of like the nuts and bolts and to transport them around. It's black steel. Uh, and black steel is great for baking in the oven because it conducts heat really well. It doesn't warp when it's baking. And so that cheese also that's baking around the rim gets nice and golden. Uh, and you can cure those pans and you essentially never have to wash them. You can just wipe them clean. Uh, but this was an interesting picture to find. I mean, imagine, you know, making that, you know, just looking down there and going, well, I think that's the pan. And in essence, that is, uh, you know, where the origin of, of this pan came from. You can see it there. Yes, this is true. Our favorite Detroit South Pizza wasn't in Detroit, it was in LA. Uh, if anybody here is from LA, I recommend you go to Apollonia's Pizzeria, which is, I mean, just look at that. Uh, I mean, it, it's making me hungry right now just salivating looking at it. But one of the things that, that they do at this pizzeria is like the, you see that exaggerated freak around the border. Uh, it killed me because he didn't want to tell us how he did it. It was like a trade secret. Uh, and I respect that. You know, I know where to stop pushing. I don't want to be annoying either when I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions. But eventually we figured out how to get that rim. Uh, and you're not going to like it. <laughs> because uh, there's different kinds of pizza cheese. And so, you, you know, we get the, the, you know, typically you use like, it's called, uh, you know, part skin mozzarella. It's typically what is used in most, you know, New York style pizzas. But then there's like the cheapy, you know, not so good versions that are combined with uh, this powder that is uh, polydextrose. And so it's to keep it from getting gummed up. It's to keep it from, you know, getting all, you know, gummy during service. But that's the only cheese that would give us that rim. And then I realized that's why he didn't want to tell us, because it's not, uh, I don't have any problem with it, but purists will go like, no, you shouldn't use that cheese. I mean, personally, if it works and it's delicious, use whatever you want. So anyway, if you're in LA, definitely hit the spot. It's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite pizzas ever. Portland, uh, so we got into a little bit of trouble because when this book came out, we said Portland is the best pizza city in the world. Uh, and, you know, I can, I can see how somebody would say that's absurd. Why? What do you mean Portland? There's no Portland-style pizza. And that may be true, but Portland per capita, we're talking about 650,000 people, the amount of great, not good, great pizzerias in the city is overwhelming. Um, this is a, a, you know, one of the things that they have in their favor is that they don't have a style. They don't have to make any sort of style that they don't want to make. They can make New York, they can make Detroit. They don't have to make Portland-style pizza. They have accessibility to terrific ingredients, terrific produce, artisan cheeses, artisan meats, all of these things that all they need to do is make a really good crust and bake it right. And Portland does it. 
Uh, there is a, yeah, I mean, people make fun of, of Portlandia, uh, but, you know, definitely it's a, a spot that is to be reckoned with. It's worth doing a pizza trip just to Portland, uh, which we did. But if you're ever in that area, there's at least five or six pizzerias that you definitely need to take a look at. So, She made one of our favorites. Her name is Sarah Minnick. Uh, it's very interesting because Sarah doesn't put sauce on her pizza uh, because she doesn't want to. So she puts cheese, she goes to the farmer's market every day, uh, finds the best produce, and then what was in the market that morning is on a pizza at night. Uh, and like I said, she rarely ever uses sauces. If anything, she uses cream. She only uses tomatoes if they're in season. So anyway, she does a fantastic job. So highly recommend her pizzas. So artisanal pizza. So this was a, a term that we were trying to figure out, uh, you know, what what do we call this pizza that some people would call California style pizza? And you know, granted these three people are based here. You have Wolfgang Puck, many years ago. Uh, you have Nancy Silverton and Alice Waters. All of these people make extraordinary pizza or are known for the pizza. Wolfgang Puck for the salmon and caviar pizza. But Nancy Silverton's matza and Alice Waters uh, you know, uh, Chez Panisse, they used to have, uh, they, they started this movement of making, you know, basically pizzas with amazing products on top, almost like an entree, but on a pizza, right? So, but with a delicious crust, a crust that had maybe higher hydration, was crispier, bubblier, browner, darker. Uh, so we decided to, to call this pizza artisanal rather than California style, because we saw this sort of pizza in different parts of the world. So this is more or less what, what we're talking about because it's not a soft crust like Neapolitan. Uh, it could be a little thinner. In the bottom right you have like Wolfgang's, Wolfgang Puck's uh, pizza with the salmon and the caviar. Uh, but these are, are, are more organic looking pizzas if, if we could put it one way, right? Uh, but with the very well thought out toppings, uh, harmonious toppings that are, take a little bit more work than just putting cheese and, and pepperoni on top. First pizza chain, Shakey's Pizza. Uh, I saw one the other day. I, I drove my daughter to uh, college three weeks ago, and we saw one in Redmond, California. Uh, and I thought they didn't exist anymore, and I just had to stop, pull over, and take a picture. But this was the first chain. The first chain was, was Shakey's Pizza. I don't know if you remember going to it, but it used to, maybe that's my recollection that, you know, my, my childhood pizza was delicious. Um, I grew up in Mexico City, and we had Shakey's Pizza in Mexico City, and I, I have fond memories of it. I, I, my daughter's like, do you want to go? And I'm like, no. Because I, I, I follow my own advice there. Don't go to places that you used to go to as a kid. So, Some of the Italian pizzas that are not pizza, you can see this here. Uh, you know, Pizza Bianca, Pizza Rosa, Campo Franco, Pizza Rustica. They're called pizzas, but they're not quite pizzas. The most funny one is in the bottom right, uh, which is called... Uh, double crunch pizza, and that to me just looks like a sandwich, sorry, but that is a sandwich. Cheese, I mean, you can have pizza without cheese, or you, and you can have pizza without sauce, but at least you have to have one of these. Cheese is super important. Uh, we did, uh, you know, some of the research on Asian mozzarella, there's, there's, there's a reason behind that, because typically you have uh, people that actually import mozzarella daily from Italy, and I can't think of a worse way to, you know, just burn up the planet with carbon emissions than to fly cheese in from Italy every day just for some thought you have that it needs to be as fresh as possible. When in reality, we did all of these experiments to figure out, okay, when is it fresh? When is it best? And what is best? How does it melt? How does it stretch? Does it let go of a lot of the serum or whey? Uh, so, I'm going to save you a lot of money, and I'm going to tell you that mozzarella is best by day five. Okay, so you don't need to fly it in daily from Italy. Save your money, make your own. It's easy to make your own mozzarella, but if you have to bring mozzarella in from Italy, just wait five days, and it'll melt the best, it'll stretch the best, and it won't let go of, of any of that serum. Who's had Provel cheese? Who's had St. Louis style pizza? If you live, the, yeah. What do you guys think? No, they're nodding. They're saying no. No good. <laughs> uh, and that's okay. And yes, but it's it, what is important is that this is a style. This is a, a it's used in a style of pizza. It's called St. Louis style pizza. This is a cheese that was developed for this particular type of pizza. It's thin crust, cracker thin. Provel is a combination of three cheeses. It's a combination. This is an American invention. It's a combination of Swiss, smoked provolone, and mozzarella. 
Um, and basically it has a texture of like American cheese, which is that when it melts, it doesn't stretch. And this is something that the people who developed this cheese were looking for. A cheese that when you cut the pizza, it didn't pull back. I don't know that I don't like that. Uh, I like stretchy pizza, so if you don't have Provel cheese ever in your life, you're not really missing out tremendously. Uh, but now you know it exists, you might want to taste it out of curiosity. Uh, and if you're in St. Louis, you know, go to IMO's, I-M-O. Uh, that's like the place to go for St. Louis style pizza. And once you've had it, you can say you've had it. American pizza cheese is important. I mean, this is something that is not used in many parts of the world, especially not in Italy, but this is, it comes from mozzarella. It's sometimes part skin, but it's a cheese that melts really well at around like 600 degrees Fahrenheit. It browns, it's stretchy, it bubbles. Uh, it's, it is a, an American invention as well. Tomato sauce, you know, the previous panel that we're, they were talking about, you know, could you imagine Thai cuisine without tomatoes, without papaya, without all these things? Can you imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes? And I'm telling you this because there weren't always tomatoes in Italian cuisine. There was a point where uh, they made their way into Italian gastronomy, but one of the things about tomatoes is that people with money thought that tomatoes were poisonous because they're in a group of plants that's called nightshades. And so people who were wealthy would have tomato plants, but only as, decora as decoration. Where people who are poor, they're like, well, if I'm hungry, I'm going to taste it, and it's going to be fine. And so a lot of people would put tomatoes on pizza. It's basically sauce and dough, and that was the first pizza. Uh, some Marzano tomatoes, these are prized tomatoes. Is it the best tomato in the world? It's a fantastic tomato, but you can make really good tomato sauce with really good tomatoes no matter where they're from. But these are very highly valued. Uh, it's a type of tomato that has like a, an Audi belly button on the tip. They're long like this. Um, it is a, a prized uh, thing to put on your menu when you use San Marzano tomatoes. The problem with that is that it's a very small region that produces these tomatoes, so it, it, it opened itself up to a lot of fraudulent sort of like uh, companies claiming that their tomatoes were San Marzano where they were like really like whatever tomatoes. Uh, so eventually they obtained what is called a DOP, which is a Denominazione de Origine Protetta, uh, which is a protected denomination of origin, which says if these tomatoes are from San Marzano, uh, it's guaranteed that it's from San Marzano. There's some canning companies that go the extra mile, and it's because the, the, the tomatoes will be San Marzano, but also the juice is from San Marzano tomatoes. Often, it's a combination of San Marzano tomatoes and tomato juice from like cheaper tomatoes. Uh, that, so that double DOP is, is, does make a bit of a difference. All right, I need to hurry up here. Uh, Tilly Lewis. She was basically uh, responsible for, for the uh, original like, canning of American tomatoes. Uh, she was called a tomato queen. Uh, she, she built this, uh, the, the, a canning, uh, tomato canning empire and, until she passed away in 1971, so uh, an important person in the landscape of American pizza. Toppings, I'm going to zip through this a bit. Some of the interesting ones we found. Uh, me, having been born in Mexico, I had to introduce uh, the fact that we love putting lime on everything, and that includes pizza, uh, hot sauce on everything, and that includes pizza, and also salsa maggi, which is a, a, like a Mexican soy sauce, if you will. So we, that, those are like things that you have to put on pizza in Mexico. But so other interesting ones, uh, you know, banana on pizza. You don't have to ever have banana and pizza. Trust me, if you think it's bad, it is bad. And you don't need to challenge yourself with that. I did it for you so that you don't have to do it. Uh, but anyway, there's different preferences. I mean, it really adapts to whatever produce there is around the world. So uh, Tommy's don't make a style. So for example, when we talk about Hawaiian pizza, it's not a style, it's a topping. Uh, you may or may not know this, but it originated in Canada. It did not originate in Hawaii. Pepperoni, it's an American thing too. This is something that we invented here. Uh, it is, there's nothing like it in Italy. Uh, but I wanted to skip to this. Well, you know how cupping pepperoni is now like the more popular form of pepperoni versus the flat one? It has to do with the casing. But I found this uh, ad from a Pizza Quarterly magazine, which exists. Um, but this is from the 1980s, and it's from Hormel. And it's when Hormel decided to remove the casing to save a few bucks. Uh, so now the marketing is like, flat is better, 
right? 1980. And so we bought into that, and there's a whole generation that missed out on cupping pepperoni. Um, and I say this because we got used to flat pepperoni. And now people are demanding cupping pepperoni, and so Hormel has gone back to making cupping pepperoni, which is it's an interesting sort of like cycle to go through. Uh, but it's what gives us that delicious, you know, puddle of fat inside. It curls up, it gets crispy on the rim. There's no competition here. Then, you know, flat pepperoni is fine, but cupping pepperoni to me is infinitely better. So, uh, let's see. I'm right at an hour. Do I have time for questions or? Yeah, we have time for a couple questions. Okay. So, are there questions on the app or are they? I've got some on the app. Yeah, you might be able to guess what the first one is. What's your favorite pizza? Uh huh. <laughs> Jesus, uh, that's like saying, "What's your favorite child?" I don't know. Uh, I mean, it just it depends because, like, if I had to pick my top three in the United States, it would be Chris Bianco in Phoenix. Uh, it would be uh, uh, Dan Richer in Raza, as I said, and then Apollonia's in uh, no, a Pizza Shoals in in Portland. Uh, probably my favorite in the United States, but there's so many others that are delicious. Uh, and those are sort of like similar in style. So. Cool. Thank you. Um, a lot of the questions that were submitted, you, you did already cover. Um, I think you covered, can you tell us the history of ZA pretty pretty well? So thank you. <laughs> ZA. <laughs> Z-A-W. Um, yeah. uh, one question here is something that you sort of touched on. Uh, does the water of a region make any difference in the dough? No. So we need to put that to rest. No. Uh, and I think the most important thing to remember about water and dough is that if you can drink it, if you look at the water and it's clear, it's not slimy, it doesn't smell like anything, it'll make good dough. It'll make good pizza. Uh, and there are no magical powers attributed to, to water. So, uh, you know, if you live in a place that has hard water, get a filter. Uh, because that will affect the dough. But if it's water that you're you can drink, that you'll drink, it'll be fine in a dough. Cool, thank you. Yeah, went through a lot of stuff in the app. Um, anybody just on the floor have any questions? I can run the mic to you. We probably have time for like two quick questions because we got a bit of a late start. I see you. Unless I was extremely clear. And then can you just touch on the best flour that we can find for pizza in the U.S.? That's always relative. But what kind of if you if we're going if we're talking about let's say a Neapolitan style pizza. I want a flour that's not super strong. I want something that is around 11.5% protein. So it's a dough that I want to stretch and I want it to stay stretched. I don't want it to recoil too much. But if I want to make like a New York style pizza, I want a stronger flour. I want like 14%, right? Uh, so it varies. If I'm going to do like a Detroit style, I'm going to want to combine it with semolina. Uh, so that it, when I stretch it, it stays stretched and it doesn't pull back. Because one of the problems when we're baking a pan pizza is getting it to fill the pan. And you're going to see this in many pizzerias. It drives me nuts. The corner that is round instead of like pointy like the, the pan. That's because the dough tends to want to like pull back in. So that's why I like to combine like a, a flour with semolina so that it will kind of get into the pan and I can stretch it and it'll stay put when it goes into the pan and it won't like balloon up when, it, when we're baking it. So it varies from pizza to pizza. Do you have anything specific in the book or just like notes in general for those of us that live at high altitude? Yeah, well in high altitude what's going to happen is that you're going to reach uh, a, uh, it's harder to reach that higher temperature. Your water's going to boil at a lower temperature. So if for example I'm baking X pizza at, let's say, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, I would probably go bake at a lower temperature. Uh, you're typically, if you're at a higher altitude, you're gonna have, it's gonna be a lot drier. So try to keep your doughs covered at all times, uh, making sure that they don't form a skin on top. Um, hopefully you're not baking at home because I can't help you with that. Uh, unless you get like a baking steel, which is like a metal base, it's, better than a baking stone. A baking steel is like infinitely better. Um, if you're serious about pizza at home, I would probably invest in like a uni or a rock box or something like that, which are, are actually really good for that. Yeah, um, thanks so much for the questions. Francisco, any, any final thoughts? No, I mean, I mean, for me more than anything, it's, uh, I, I, I'm happy to talk pizza. It's a, it's a food that we all feel, uh, you know, strongly about. 
uh, but hopefully this was a, it inspired you to go and get a slice or maybe make pizza. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah.